Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I'm going to continue my introduction to Romanticism. Previously, I have introduced some of the main themes and uh, philosophies of the Romantic poets, how they kind of define poetry, how they determine what is good poetry, what is bad poetry, how uh, they, they uh, rely on imagination uh, or, the, uh, or the kind of creative faculty as it is introduced by Coleridge. So uh, today I'm going to continue the discussion to introduce some main themes of Romanticism. And the first topic is the supernatural, the romance and psychological extremes. Uh, romantics, uh, if you want to talk about them generally, uh, divide their poetry between two extremes or two poles. If there is a kind of spectrum for the romantic poetry on, on one end of that spectrum, stands sublimity and what is sublime and on the other side on the other end of that spectrum uh, we can find what is grotesque so the romantics not only deal with the sublimity of nature that sense of awe or that sense of fear or that sense of admiration or a combination of all these feelings but also at the same time they they, they focus on what is supernatural on what is grotesque and what is extraordinary so and, and, and that extraordinariness is not necessarily in a positive sense of the term. Uh, just imagine the monster in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's not, it's not a positive kind of sublimity, rather it's a grotesque vision of it, or a grotesque kind of creation. Uh, so the romantics explore both sides of that. Partly they are influenced by what was the Gothic tradition or the Gothic novels of the previous century. At the end of the 18th century, some novelists started to explore irrationality in their novels. Many of those novels were set in medieval Italy or Spain, so affecting uh, the uh, Catholic kind of viewpoint and how uh, those countries uh, kind of uh, heritage, Catholic heritage, and that uh, vintage point of view as, as it is connected with medieval and Catholic were represented in those novels such as The Mysteries of Udolfo or um, Horace Walpole's uh, eminent uh, creation actually. So uh, the, all these novels um, they were written in a, in a tradition in which we saw for example a kind of isolated place or landscape and a tower or a building with some subterranean passages and a woman captivated uh, by uh, by an evil main character so it, it, these are just uh, uh, like um, the the imagery or the kind of themes or major topics dealt with in those gothic novels the romantics also are influenced by that atmosphere, Gothic atmosphere, for example, Lord Biden and his Manfred, but not necessarily all of it. So uh, they are kind, mm, kind of influenced by Gothic tradition and the medieval revival, but they have also added the tinge, the color of the romantic grotesque to it. And uh, the, the romance, of course, this, this, the source of that kind of romance comes from uh, medieval uh, forms of romances and psychological extremes. You know, psychological issues or psychological topics were quite modern at that, at that time. For the first time, uh, the exploration of the psyche, the self, the definition of that, that they're kind of the soul or the spirit of the human beings in the form of what, what is now called, what is today called psychology, but for first time just discussed the workings of the mind, the workings of the memory, different theories were available at the time. And the romantics tried to show them uh, one way or another in their works. Uh, Coleridge, for example, and uh, the Biographia Literaria, which is a kind of um, book of criticism or book of philosophy, of poetry and literature written by Coleridge explains that when he and Wordsworth were working on the lyrical ballads, his uh, division of labor was to work on the supernatural or to affect, affect the supernatural issues. And the poems, for example, in the rhyme of the ancient mariner, uh, which, which was one of the strangest kind of uh, additions to lyrical ballads, and it was, you know, reacted uh, in this way by the critics, the critics were reacting negatively to that. What is it? Uh, he explores what is supernatural, the idea of the life after death or death men walking, the idea of death just throwing dice with life and death, 
uh, the idea of the soul, the spirit, um, I don't know, uh, the idea of that um, a nine fathom deep uh, creature just following the ship. So all of them are, are there or the supernatural kind of influence of, of that beard um upon the whole crew of the ship so uh Samuel Ted, of course not only in this poem but in in his other poetry not necessarily published in lyrical ballads like Christabel uh like Frost at Midnight like Kubla Khan explores such ideas uh, there is always a supernatural color in his works or in his poetry we can say in general and uh Besides that, we can say that uh, there are uh, stories written at the time of the Romantics, uh, other in uh, in the form of narrative poetry, sometimes uh, works of fiction, stories of bewitchings, hauntings, and possession, uh, shaped by antiquated treatises on demonology, folklore, and Gothic novels, supplied him uh, and other Romantic uh, the means of impressing upon readers a sense of occult powers and unknown modes of being. Uh, and um, famously, Jane Austen has uh, written a parody to all this, Northanger Abbey, uh, in which she marks that Gothic tra tradition, but anyway, it was available at the time. And also those themes are explored and dealt with in Jane Austen's novel. Uh, this painting is uh, actually by Caspar David Friedrich, and it shows that kind of medieval abbey, uh, which is among oak in that kind of uh, grotesque and gothic atmosphere. Many romantics, when uh, they talked about gothicism or that grotesquery, have such scenery in mind. So they um, kind of share um, what is called the theme of medieval revival in, in uh, romanticism, especially that they uh, borrowed some elements from those medieval romances. Or the, uh, as I uh, already said, um, some of the works were set in Italy or Spain to show the interrelationship uh, of Gothicism or Gothic tradition, uh, medievalism, and Catholicism. Uh, generally speaking, we can say uh, that the Romantics uh, were in search of the addition of a strangeness to beauty. This is what Walter Pater has written about the Romantics. Walter Pater was a Victorian aesthetician and he, um, he, he was concerned with the formation and construction of beauty in a work of art. And he thinks that this beauty, sometimes in the case of the Romantics, is added up to what is a strange. Um, as um, it was the case, for example, with Edgar Allan Poe, as he's also uh, mentioned here, um, he, there is a quote here, there is no exquisite beauty without some strangeness in proportion. So, and, and you can read his short stories or his poetry like The Raven to feel this. So the romantics not only talked about beautiful, what is beautiful, what is, you know, extra sublime even, but also about what is what is beautiful or strange in a negative sense? So that grotesquery is again the case here, like the story of the beauty and the beast. The beast that is just that kind of romantic beauty, but but just covered in something ugly. But but you can feel uh, that that beautiful aspect of it. Uh, different Romantic poets deal with this idea of Gothic and grotesque in different ways. So, for example, we have William Wordsworth, who in some of his poems, like Year Seven, explores uh, the different points of view of a child and an adult and how the, the, the judgment of a child can violate the judgment of an adult person. So he he deals with that kind of psychological aspects or the poles of psychology of a mature person and a child. Uh, but Wordsworth is a soft version of that, Coleridge and De Quincey, because both of them were affected by some drugs. Both of them were sick and they used uh, painkillers such as uh, laudanum, or opium, so uh, they were some sometimes high, and they explored uh, the process of imagination in that state. So, for example, Kojus Kubla Khan is written exactly at the time that he was high, and then have, have was just uh, you know dreaming about something, uh, and then the images were 
uh, rising just in front of his eyes. So he had a vision in the in the dream, and then he tried to turn that dream into a poem. Of course, he was disturbed. And Thomas De Quincey also uh, explores uh, those um, pains of opium, the pleasures of opium in his Confessions of an English Opium Eater. John Keats, uh, you know, is a specific case. John Keats was always haunted by death. And in his poetry, death appears as a character, sometimes in form of a femme fatale, a woman uh, who is uh, killing or who is uh, just uh, giving some harm to the main character, like um, what, what is the case in La Belle Dame Sans Merci, a medieval uh, form of revival because it's about a knight who is bewitched by, by a woman who has brought death to him or many others. So um, in, his, in this poem and in some other poetry written by John Keats, he deals with that topic. He, he considers death as that kind of strange character appearing in the lives of human beings. And uh, maybe Byron had also explored uh, that kind of Gothicism and supernatural by the production of the Byronic hero or satanic hero. I will talk about Byronic hero in a few minutes, but, but generally speaking, we can say that Lord Byron, uh, uh, you know, by, by dealing with forbidden topics such as incest in his play Manfred uh, or mm, some other things he had written, uh, you know, not necessarily incest in them, but forbidden topics. By dealing with forbidden topics is experimenting with the extremes of human morality. And the, uh, the other theme is the theme of individualism and alienation. Uh, the Romantic poets uh, preferred loneliness sometimes. So uh, the, the main objective of a poet was to express his or her feelings. Uh, the, the audience was not the primary object out there to be addressed. Rather, the poet found poetry as a kind of psychological or um, spiritual remedy. Uh, or an outlet, a natural outlet for a great imagination. So uh, the romantic poetry is, uh, poet is quintessentially an alien figure and many others could not just understand uh, the feeling, the atmosphere, the spirit the rom uh, that the romantic poet felt. Uh, famously, Hazlitt has written of Byron uh, Byron and his loneliness or his kind of uh, interest in creating lonesome characters. Um, Hazlitt quotes uh, a part of Shakespeare's Coriolanus to depict Byron as if a man were author of himself and owned no other kin. And he thinks Byron is such a figure, such a solitary figure in this world. And you see how the paintings of Vieira are also representing the same thing. And this brilliant painting by Caspar uh, David Friedrich, we see a woman just in front of the sunrise and you see how he had worked on, on the rays of the sun before it's coming out. And uh, once again, we see a lonesome figure in close contact with nature. So, um, uh, as you see in this context, many writers' choice, it was a choice to poetry poetry as a product of solitude and poesis loners might be understood as means of reinforcing the individuality of their vision. So if, if they emphasize that we are different, they also show that how the literary products stand out and are different from other literary products because they are made out by a lonesome mind. They were not influenced by any other figures. They were unique and virgin in their topics, in their language, in the themes dealt in those works. And that's why, and exactly it is for this reason, that many romantics, when they want to talk about nature or they want to uh, when they want to explore the beauties of nature, they prefer wilderness, those caves or th those uninhabitable uh, places in the wilderness, uh, which were far from urbanization, which were not influenced by humankind, because like them, this part of nature was also pure and unique and not yet 
you know, uh, just polluted by the presence of the others, or even if they were in places in which others were, for example, in case of uh, William Wordsworth as Tintern Abbey, he is um, in Tintern Abbey, and in that abbey there were, for example, many beggars or other visitors, but Wordsworth just doesn't see them because he wants to explore the relationship between himself and that building or that natural uh, beauty or scenery. Uh, about um, the genres of Romanticism, uh, besides poetry, which was the topic of discussion till this moment, we can talk about um, other novel genres in, uh, uh, you know, being introduced in Romanticism. One such genre was familiar essay. Essays uh, previously were influenced in English literature, were influenced by figures such as uh, Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon is the one who had talked about the scientific method, how you uh, you just follow an algorithm to do a research and how that research would, for example, turn up into an essay. What, what today we do in doing research is much influenced by Francis Bacon. But the Romantics uh, did not believe in such objectivity. Rather, they wanted to write uh, essays which were very familiar, very subjective. And the figures who had, you know, written uh, such essays um, are William Hazlitt, Charles Lamb, and Thomas De Quincey. About the characteristics of uh, this genre, we can say that familiar essay uh, uh, produces or even shares in the intimate feelings and the commentaries of the author with the audience, so the audience is not embarrassed uh, embarrassed to to talk about, you know, even embarrassing topics. Uh, often presented as if prompted by incidents in the author's private life. So like the romantic poets, the romantic essays also talk about a subjective attitude. And on an eclectic range of topics taken from the personal life of the author. Other uh, literary forms of romanticism includes drama. The picture you see here um, is uh, actually a painting of a girl called Beatrice and Shelley came across uh, this figure in his uh, readings while he, he was living in Italy and it inspired him to write it write a play about her. I will call, um, I will talk about this play later, uh, but, but uh, there was a problem with drama at the time. Uh, first of all, because of the Licensing Act. Licensing Act meant that uh, whosoever it was, um, what dramatist, what poet, it doesn't matter, wanted to publish and then, you know, just stage a play to, per to make a performance out of his play in a theatre house. Um, had to be licensed by the Lord Chamberlain. So you could not do this uh, unless that very figure would let you do that. And it was very difficult because of uh, some uh, socio-political issues, especially the French Revolution and, and the like, the American Revolution. Uh, the English were very conservative and they didn't let uh, the theaters produce uh, dramas. The Romantics were controversial figures. They talked about uh, forbidden topics on the one hand. And on the other hand, the government was worried about that. And we can also say that uh, theater houses uh, were crowded places. So um, the, a majority of the people or, or kind of gathering, a big gathering of the people um, was a threat to the government because the play subject matter would induce something in the audience and then the audience would come out and start a, um, like a street riot or something. So the government was very conservative in that case. And another issue with romantic dramas, especially those written by Byron and Shelley, uh, was um, they were dealing with uh, forbidden topics. So um, for these many reasons, uh, the poets wrote plays in form of closet dramas. By closet drama, we mean uh, the, uh, the kind of drama which is supposed to be read rather than be performed. And um, examples are Byron's Manfred, Shelley's Prometheus Unbound, and Shelley's The Chenchi. Manfred um, is, is about one other Byronic hero. He's a fashion figure. 
Uh, he's non-repentant. He rejects both divinity and satanity, and he accepts death and his guilt. And uh, why Manfred is problematic? Uh, because of its subject matter, which is the forbidden sin. The forbidden sin is not named in the play, but uh, from the implications, from the hints which are in the play, we know that it is incest. And, uh, you, know, you know, it is also related to Byron's personal life as well. And uh, so, so uh, generally we can say that the problem with these plays were not um, the technicality, the stage direction was, was in a way that these plays could be performed, but the, uh, the case was something else. Uh, on on practical grounds, uh, these plays could not be performed. They were unstageable, especially it is the case with the Chenchi written by Percy Shelley. In the Chenchi, we have a father who kills his two sons and then rapes his own daughter. And then uh, that daughter together with her stepmother killed the father. And well, that jurisd uh, jurisdiction and, you know, the juries in Florence are just, uh, you know, can, um, sentence her to death, and after enduring some torture in the prison, she dies. So, because of the subject of the race, because the play showed um, the kind of uh, uh, issues in uh, the jury and and the kind of justice system of Italy of the of that time, uh, in a way that it was related to what is up in England. So the corruption in that system was easily uh, understood and perceived by the audience, by the audience to be similar to what was up in England. And it was very dangerous for the English government, for example, to let such a play to be staged. Prometheus Unbound uh, shows Shelley's extreme kind of idealism we know that Aeschylus has written a play, Prometheus Bound, because Prometheus had stolen fire from the gods. Zeus was angry with him and he was punished for that. He was bounded. And in Shelley's play, Prometheus just escapes that faith and he can just be a free subject. Like, like what was up. So we see revolt and you know, rebellion against uh, the authority in this play as uh, and it, it is again very practical remorse is not that much practical and it is considered to be the most successful romantic play because it was staged for 20 nights in 1813 uh, the play was originally called osorio but course later on some years later changed uh, some other you know some some uh, themes and ideas in the in the in that play and changed the, t uh, the title from Osorio to Remorse. Uh, it is it is a kind of Gothic. It is happening in Spain, the Catholic Spain. And uh, we see, for example, the issues between the Muslims and the Christians at the time. Uh, it is the story of two brothers. One of them tries to kill the other, but he's not uh, actually murdered. And he, he comes back to the story with a new form in form of a magician and tries to take revenge from his brother. And it is about the remorse Osorio is going to just endure in that play. I talked about Manfred being a Byronic hero. Let us just uh, check out the characteristics of a Byronic hero. A Byronic hero um, has a distaste for social institutions and social norms, and he has his own norms of living. He has his own rules of living. Uh, he, even if he is a social figure, like as for example, Don John, uh, but um, at the same time, he cannot stand all those restrictions uh, imposed on a figure in the society, especially the English society. Conflicting emotions or moodiness. Generally, a Byronic hero is moody. And um, if, if you have read Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, or if you've watched the movie, the character of Heathcliff is one. High levels of intelligence and cunning are represented. He's, he's sharper and smarter than his peers. Um, he is also very self-critical, so not only critical from the society, but critical of himself as well. And uh, mysterious origins and troubled past. Uh, either the Byronic hero doesn't have a past, or if he has one, 
is a problematic one like dungeon, self-destructive tendencies. So not suicidal necessarily, but he is not living um, and in a satisfactory way. He's not content with his life and alone and rejected from society. And this is a natural result of all these. So these are the characteristics of a Byronic hero. And of course, the Byronic hero suffers from narcissism. The other literary genre developed at the time, you know, uh, to, to, to a kind of uh, uh, more, you know, uh, experimentation was novel. Novel started in the previous century and, uh, well, for the first time, they dealt with the topic of, of realism in literature, how literature is not just a romance, it's not a love story. Uh, or a gothic story, it is a real story. And uh, novels such as Pamela or Mont Flanders or Dan and the other one written by Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe or Henry Fielding's productions uh, like Joseph Andrews were part of that tradition. But uh, the two forms of novel or novelistic tradition are added up at the time of the Romantics. The first one is uh, the historical novel, especially written by Sir Walter Scott. And the other one is uh, a, a kind of a, um, a extended form of a psychological novel written by Jane Austen. Uh, while uh, in novels such as Waverly, Sir Walter Scott dealt with the history of especially Scottish people. Jane Austen in her novels dealt with the psychological history and background and decisions of her characters. So uh, the, the, these two trends of novel were also influential in what is now a uh, novelistic tradition at the 21st century. And Scott had endorsed Jane Austen for her uh, producing or developing a new novelistic language uh, for the workings of the mind of human mind, how, how uh, 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 of human psyche, how she shows the characters uh, who are not just stable and fixed. Jane Austen's characters are Rand or developing characters. And in that sense, Jane Austen had made a great contribution to English literature. And if you ask me, uh, it is not just the case of characterization about Jane Austen. Um, her language is brilliant. Her usage of words, her grammar, her sentences are beyond um, kind of what was traditional at the time and expected from um, from a novelist. So I I strongly recommend you to to read what is written by Jane Austen to explore these things yourselves. And uh, well, this was the end of my introduction to romanticism. I hope you have enjoyed my videos and I hope I can see you in next videos.